Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'd like to uh, explain to you the process of transpiration, which is the evaporation of water from the leaf, generally, of plants, and that evaporation of water through, uh, through stomata, and this is a picture of stomata, stomata, uh, Greek for mouth, as you can see here, check this out. Uh, it, it literally is a pore, and it's found in the leaf epidermis. And the pore is sometimes open. Whoops, let me go back over here. Pause. It's sometimes open, and then sometimes closed. And what's fascinating about that is the ability for the stomata to open and close is all about these two cells that create the stomata itself. These two cells that flank the stomata are called guard cells and they can they could close or they could bow open or close or bow open. And so that's what our conversation is going to be about today. Uh, transpiration itself is simply the movement of water up the tree but it, it, the main interesting part of the conversation needs to come from a look at what's happening with those guard cells. And so let's jump right into that conversation. And so the guard cells, which are shown right here, this is a light microscope picture of the lower epidermis. There's a lot more water uh, transpiring in the lower, the underside of the leaf versus the top of the leaf. And again, that makes good sense too because the sunlight is coming down from above and that's where most of the photosynthesis is being taking place. In other words, capturing of sunlight. And then below is where... Uh, the pores are generally located, which will take in air. So the, the stomata, the point of the stomata is to take in air. And air, in terms of the plant, the plant really wants carbon dioxide, even though that's a little bit less than 1% of air. It also takes in nitrogen gas and it takes in oxygen. But then it releases oxygen gas because that's being produced in photosynthesis. But not only are the gas exchange occurring, water loss is occurring. And you're like, well, why isn't water gain occurring? Well, leaves don't necessarily take in water uh, through their stomata. They, the water arrives at the leaf via the vein, and the xylem brings that. Although there are some instances in some unique trees, like, for example, in redwood trees, coastal redwood trees, where um, surprisingly the needles can actually obtain quite a lot of water, surprisingly, um, as a result even from fog accumulation and so that high humidity uh, the trees are able to subsidize the water that they need by soaking it up from the fog that's a pretty pretty cool discussion and so you know the, before I go into any detail about this the the main point to get from this is that plants are rooted they're they're not going anywhere they're not mobile like animals are and so the big get come away home message from this is that in order to sort of react to environmental stresses, in other words, it's getting very hot out, or uh, it's very humid, or it's very dry, or it's very windy, the plant can't just sort of pick it up, pick up its tent and, and leave. It's got to make adjustments. And it'll make adjustments uh, on a cellular level, but ultimately it comes down to biochemical reactions. And so these these um, biochemical adjustments are the way in which the plant uh, acclimates to environmental change. And so even something that's routine, like for example in the morning when the sun comes up in dawn, that's when you kind of want your guard cells to open up because that's when <laughs> there's going to be lots of sunlight and that's therefore when photosynthesis takes place during the day. And so you want carbon dioxide to come in for your Calvin cycle. In the evening, since there's no sun, basically you can shut it down. And so, But if you left your guard cells open, that would just be basically a loss of water through transpiration. So guard cells are, are, can roll. They can roll with whatever the conditions present themselves. And so let's, let's get into that conversation. I think it's one of the classics uh, in, in the study of uh, plants in general. And so guard cells control, they're regulating sort of the uh, gas exchange and water balance that's needed by photosynthesis. It's needed 
transpiration, remember, is not all bad. It's needed to bring water up a, up a tree in the first place. And so what I want to say about that is uh, plants make their sugar in their leaves. You can see here in the mesophyll, in the parenchyma, the ground tissue, which is right here, the water comes to the, to the leaf here in the xylem, which is inside the vein. The bundle sheath cells surround it. So what's fascinating is the sunlight is coming from above. Like, check that out. The sunlight's coming from above, like this. And so this is really good up here. This palisade is not letting a lot of sunlight get by it, since it's like a fence. But then look down below here. The guard cells flank this pore called the stomata. So this is the stomata right there, the opening. So these guard cells will allow gas exchange, but also water. And so let me see if I can emphasize that. The water here, it's really thick. The water is what we're talking about. So the loss of the water is transpiration. Now, what's fascinating, look at this, is that though the guard cells themselves uh, don't make up much of the surface area of the underside of the leaf, when you look at the inside spongy, those, those air caverns inside the mesophyll, the spongy mesophyll, you could be like 10 to 30 times greater than the uh, external leaf uh, surface area. So that's this is good. This allows for tremendous gas exchange. So that so it's a compromise. Great gas exchange down here. Wonderful. CO2 is getting to all the cells and amazing. But then that's also accounting for the fact that you can really lose a lot of water uh, as a result of this morphology. In other words, that anatomy. Not all leaves look this way. You might be familiar. This is a classic C3 anatomy. So 90% of the water that, that uh, a plant loses escapes through its stomata, though it represents only a small surface area. And that's because of this sort of honeycomb uh, area in the spongy mesophyll. So there's a lot of evaporative loss here, which provides uh, negative uh, water potential, which then draws the water from the xylem uh, up. And so how efficient a plant is. Some are better than others with dealing with transpiration. Some will lose too much water and therefore they can't handle hot uh, environments, hot dry environments. Some plants can handle it. Not, I don't think any plant really loves hot and dry, but some, pl some plants can tolerate it better than others. Like you might recall like corn is a great example of this. Corn is a, is a plant that's a monocot but it, it, its, it's uh, veins are parallel in, in its leaf, but it also has a, an interesting leaf morphology in its C4. I can review that in a little bit later, but the way this is measured is, you know, the amount of water loss per gram of CO2 assimilated into an organic molecule, like a sugar, for example. And in, in, for most plants, it's 600 to 1, so that's a lot of water loss. But then over here, corn has less water loss. And so some plants, like C4 plants, are a little bit more efficient. And so if you recall this, the way the leaf is able to, to get away with this is that it's able to close its stomata partially and reduce water loss. And it's like, well, wait a minute. I won't get into this big conversation, but you may recall that uh, that this is a little bit of a, a worrisome situation because what can happen is if you can close these doors like this, oxygen concentration tends to build up in these air spaces and then that reduces photosynthesis because of photorespiration issue. So the way in which corn deals with this is that they use their mesophyll cells, which are all these cells right here, as a little bit of a, a buffer. They have a special enzyme called PEP carboxylase, which selectively chooses carbon dioxide over oxygen. And then that's converted from, it's attached to an already present C3 compound, and then it makes a C4 compound. And then that gets shuttled into these cells, which are called the bundle sheath cells. And the bundle sheath cells are where most photosynthesis takes place. So you sort of keep an oxygen out of the club if you will. And so carbon dioxide is dumped off in the chloroplasts here and then uh, Rubisco, ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase is able to then take the 
carbon dioxide sugar and convert it into glyceraldehyde phosphate, if you recall all of that. And so this is the way that the corn is able to roll, and we call this C4, not only because of its unique um, anatomy, but its unique physiology. And then once the sugar is produced, it jumps into the, into the phloem right there. And uh, if you watched the previous video, we talked about how this is up. Phloem picks this up th through uh, active transport, and then it's positive pressure, which pushes it down the, the vein of the, of the corn. And ultimately, this is the source of the sugar, and then it's going to be stored, like for example, in the, in the, the uh, kernels of the, uh, the corn. <laughs> and so uh, that's, what I, that's all I want to say about that. And so, um, you know, some plants do better than others I was mentioning. Like, for example, in the, in the tropics, you get these big leaves here. And so there's, you know, most plants would, would be envious but also scared. This is, happens to be banana right here. And so um, transpiration, it could be a positive thing. Like if you're losing a lot of water, there, you have to, it has to be a rainy place. And so the, the plant gets a lot of water, loses a lot of water in that, you know, just when we sweat, when we sweat, it, it creates evaporative cooling. The warmest water molecules are the ones evaporating, giving a relative cool sensation. And so you can, uh, leaves can actually cool themselves down as a result of transpiration. This is actually kind of critical. And you're like, yeah, so what do they, what do you, anyone, I don't think you're worrying about leaves getting too hot. <laughs> Although I think a plant might be worrying. Uh, because the fact if the leaf gets too hot, if it's baking in the sun like that, uh, the enzymes, the proteins that power everything in the plant cell are going to get too hot and they might actually denature and not work properly. And so transpiration helps to keep things cool as well. So transpiration is pretty critical. It's bringing water up for photosynthesis. It's uh, keeping the, the plant cool. It's doing all kinds of good things. And then, you know, here's, this is what happens when there's too much transpiration. This is one of my favorite plants. I don't know if you recognize it right here, but it's it's zucchini, and it produces these really beautiful yellow blossoms here, and that's where the fruit comes from, the zucchini or squash. These flowers are really good to eat if you if you take out these flowers and put a little flour on them and fry them with some oil, and salt, and pepper. Oh, <laughs> it's really good. So this is not good. So this is when transpiration exceeds the amount of water that's coming up, and so a plant is wilting. It's losing turgor pressure in, in the mesophyll cells. Therefore, the plant is wilting. And it's like, what do you do? What do you, maybe you would add some water. <laughs> this is what I would do. <laughs> and so ultimately, what are the, the main abiotic factors that affect transpiration? This, this is most important. Uh, when it's sunny, this is what's generating the transpiration in the first place. The heat is what's pulling the water up, the evaporation of heat. The, it's uh, increasing the molecular motion of the water molecules. So when they increase, they break their hydrogen bonds, and then that increases transpiration. So the opposite of that is on a very, very cold, cold day, you're not going to have the, so much transpiration. So it's sunny. Uh, this is what's really encouraging transpiration. Not only is it sunny, but it's very hot out. It's very dry. Obviously, if it's dry, it's going to then allow more water to come up. And then windy also encourages transpiration. And so these are the things that you don't want too much of. So plants can't handle a lot of wind, dry, warm, and sun. And so these guard cells, now, I... I I want to f uh, emphasize something. It's like, gee, they look different than the other epidermal cells. Yeah, the other epidermal cells do not contain chloroplasts. See these green structures? These chloroplasts are going to be really important because they're going to provide the guard cell with the energy necessary to open and close like this. And so the guard cells sort of regulate the size of the stomata. This is kind of in a closed position, which sort of adjusts the, the ability of the plant to photosynthesize and transpiration compromise. It's always a compromise. So the stomata are flanked by these guard cells and they can open and close. Uh, great picture is the nucleus. What happens is basically, let's go basic and then we'll add detail. When water, here's the other epidermal cells that sort of look like pu puzzle pieces like this. Like that. What happens when, when they open, it's because lots of water are 
is entering from adjacent epidermal cells. And when water enters in through osmosis, it causes these cells to swell. And when they swell, they open up like that. And the detail of that is because there's, there's cellulose fibers like this, which are part of the cytoskeleton. Usually you think of cytoskeleton as protein fibers, but here they're sugar fibers. And so when the cell um, swells, it causes it to bow as a result of those uh, microfibrils inside. And then that allows gas exchange and water exchange. And so you're, the question that you might be having at this is like, well, what's causing that? Anytime water moves, it's water potential. Anytime water goes from one area to another area, it's because the water potential is lower in the guard cells. So that's a mystery. Why is the gar guard cells suddenly having low osmotic potential. So I'll let, I'll let that sit for a second. So uh, the guard cells control the diameter by opening and closing, and it takes two to do that. Uh, when they become turgid, in other words, when they fill with water, the cellulose microfibers then cause the cell to buckle a little bit outward, and therefore that creates the gap, which we call the stomata. And then in the evening, when water leaves, they become flaccid and then that closes the stomata. And so here's a real picture of it. Here's the adjacent uh, epidermal cells. Here are the two guard cells. You can see here this is closed, slightly open, and notice the chloroplasts are inside. So what causes this? Well, it's a, it's a pretty complicated mechanism, and it involves uh, uptake of potassium ions, and it, it also causes uh, involves active transport and cation exchange. And so all of that results in the water filling up. And so ultimately, water is moving into the guard cells and having them open. And so let me take a break from the notes and come over here and, and try to walk you through this process. And so I want you to keep this image in your mind of these epidermal cells and these guard cells. So I'm going uh, to make an attempt to draw that. And so what we've got going here is I'm going to make these guard cells like this. And so here's my stomata, like that. And then over here, this is your ordinary epidermal cell. Epidermal cell, epidermal cell, like this. And so here's my question. Now, why did the water go in and cause the, why did the water cross the cell membrane? You know, osmosis, yes. But what lowered the water potential? So in the morning, this is, what, this is one of the hypotheses that we have about how guard cells open. In the morning, because these cells have chloroplasts, the sunlight comes and strikes the chloroplast, which gives the, this plant the ability to produce um, adenosine triphosphate, ATP. And as a result of that, what the cells are then capable of doing is that there's some protons in here. It always comes down to protons, doesn't it? So there's some protons, and there's protons everywhere. And one, one could say that the protons are uh, in equal concentration on both sides of guard cells and epidermal cells. But then check this out. What the cell then does is that it uses its energy right here, sticks a phosphate on here, which then produces adenosine diphosphate. And what it does is it pushes the protons, pushes, this is active transport, pushes it. And so this area over here in the epidermal cells becomes very positive, or you could say it becomes very acidic, or you could say that it's highly concentrated in protons, uh, or basically you could just say that these cells are becoming very plus. And if the epidermal cells are becoming positive, then relatively speaking, the guard cells are negative. And so this creates an electrochemical gradient, which is the potential to do work. And so as a result of that, check this out. As a result of that, there's these other solutes called potassium, and those are positively charged. Potassium is also present in all these cells, like this. You're getting the picture, in equal concentrations. But then check this out. As a result of this being positive and this being negative inside, negative inside the guard cell, 
those potassium ions are really attracted. They're like, I wouldn't like to go into the guard cell. I would like to go in there and check it out. It's very negative. I'm, I'm attracted. And so watch this. When the potassium then flows into the guard cells like this, because it's attracted to the negative ions, what it's going to do is it, that's going to create a hypertonic environment inside the guard cell. Hypertonic is then going to attract water because the solute lowers the water potential. It's a negative water potential inside here. So let's say it's negative 0.23 megapascals. And so the water then flows in, water flows in, water flows in. Look at the water flowing in because there's lots of potassium now in here. Water flows in, water flows in, water flows in, and then what happens? The cell begins to bow open because of the cellulose microfibers. You see that? And so that causes that opening. And that is what, how carbon dioxide gets into the plant. And that's how oxygen leaves. And that's how water leaves the leaf through the stomata. Okay, so there you go. That's what I wanted to say about that. And so let's go back over here, check it out. So uh, obviously this is better drawn than mine, but here's the potassium shown in red. When potassium moves over and it creates a hypertonic environment, the water then follows. And then, you know, it's like, well, that's how it opens. How does it close? Well, think about that. How does it close? You should be able to answer that on your own. How does it close? Well, in the evening, when there's no sunlight, there's no ATP. No ATP, that means no energy to create the proton gradient, which then won't attract the potassium, and then the potassium will simply diffuse from high concentration to low concentration. So the potassium then leaves the guard cells, and then when the potassium leaves, the water leaves following it, and then the cells are not turgid anymore, and therefore they close. So that's kind of cool. So it's potassium fluxes across the guard cell membranes as, as a consequence of the uh, proton pump. So the proton pump creates, creates this cation exchange. So this is inside the guard cell. So because the protons have been pumped out here, the potassium gets attracted in. And this similar thing happens in the root, if you recall that. So in general, uh, the stomata open in day and they close at night. And then if light is the cue, um, it's what's producing the ATP and the proton pump and the potassium. And so that's kind of neat. And so the chloroplasts are able to do this. Now, let me bring up a couple of, of not contradictory, but also um, potential ways in which guard cells can, can close or to open. Now, when... A, the a second stimulus other than light, if there's a low a depletion of carbon dioxide right there, that can actually cause stomata to want to open. So the cells are sensitive to carbon dioxide gas. That influences them as well. Uh, check this out. There's a, an internal clock. They've studied these, these plants like in a total dark environment. And it, and it seems as though the guard cells open up in the same time in the day in the morning and close at night without even light being present. You're like, wow, what's, what's that all about? Well, it's as if they're being regulated by some kind of mechanism on a, on a, on a, uh, a regular clock, like a circadian rhythm, like circa means cir a circle, so around a day, circa, cir circa or circadian, Dadian is a day, so around a day rhythm, a 24-hour cycle. So you're like, oh, how, did, how does that work? Well, that's a very complicated mechanism, but it might be something like there might be a chemical in the guard cell, in other words, that influences the opening and closing by when it becomes depleted. If you think of this analogy, like if there's a chemical like sands in an hourglass, as the chemicals become depleted from one area, then they get converted into something else into another chamber and then when that gets flipped around it goes back and so it's sort of like a ne negative feedback in other words when something gets too high it then shuts off and then when it's low it comes back up again 
So it's sort of rhythm, rhythm. it oscillates. And that cycle between the, the peaks or the troughs happens to be around 24 hours, so it's around a day. So that's kind of cool. If you're interested in this, uh, further investigate this. Circadian rhythms and guard cells opening and closing. I find that, that this is mysterious, but there is no real mysteries. It's really some chemicals involved in it, but it's kind of cool. And then there's even uh, another uh, environmental stress that can cause guard cells to open and close. And that is, you know, you might think, well, if a plant is suffering and it's drying up, there's some sort of water deficiency, the guard cells uh, would want to close as to prevent further losses. And so what was detected by botanists is that there's a hormone called abscisic acid. Abscisic acid uh, is a hormone that's produced uh, by mesophyll cells in response to water deficiency, and that causes the guard cells to close. And so that hormone then travels into the guard cell, and what's cool about it is this is a great example of signal transduction. In other words, the hormone binds to receptor proteins in the guard cell membranes, and then that sends a signal inside the cell to uh, cause the cells to close. And so ultimately, if the cells are closing, water's leaving. This is, this is the point. What I've explained to you before is the truth with regard to all of these factors. If you want the guard cells to close, you've got to, water has to leave. And so it's all about regulating these ions and affecting osmosis. And so abscisic acid can cause guard cells to close. And high temperatures can also uh, cause the stomata to open and close. Check this out. At high temperatures, that increases the rate of photo, not increases the rate of cell respiration, which produces a lot of CO2, and so therefore that combined, with the increase in CO2 causes uh, the stomata to uh, close during the day, and so that's kind of interesting too at high temperatures, which reduces transpirational losses. So finally, what I want to say about transpiration is that in addition to uh, C4 plants. Some other plants have some really cool adaptations to reduce transpirational loss. You may remember one of them called a cam plant, like for example a cactus, Crassulaceae acid metabolism. But plants in general that are adapted to dry climates are called xerophils or phytes, xerophytes, xerophytes. And they have interesting leaf modifications, in other words like different ways to do it that reduce transpirational loss. And some of them have smaller leaves, which reduces the surface area, like needles. Some of these leaves are rather thick. And so that reduces sort of the surface area. If you think of it being um, the opposite of that as being thin and flat, these are thick and small. They reduce that, so surface area. And then some plants are just really waxy. They have this really thick, 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 thick cuticle, which resists transpirational losses. So plants are called uh, xerophytes that have these things. And then cactus, obviously, are great examples of this, that their leaves are so thin that they're not even photosynthesizing. They're, they're just uh, protective against uh, herbivores. And so check this out. This is a really cool one right here. Look at the lower epidermis. Do you know how the lower epidermis has the guard cells? Well, some plants have these little crypts right here, these little caves or alcoves right in there. And so this is where the guard cells are. So if on a windy day, windy, 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 you know how windy increases transpirational losses? The wind doesn't get inside this little cave. And so therefore, this reduces transpirational, these little crypts. They shelter the pores from the dry wind. Not only do they do that, if, if that's not enough, sometimes leaves have little hairs on them and uh, some hairs inside here. The hairs will slow the wind down so that the moisture that does come out, is it's more humid in these crypts and therefore there's less transpiration as a result of high humidity. So high humidity r resists transpiration. Isn't that incredible? These crypts and the hair. So these little hairs that are in there, and then the fact that these crypts reduce transpirational losses by keeping the humidity higher inside there versus the surrounding air. Remarkable. Look at this. Look at this cross-section here. 
the palisade, and then look at this, a huge thick cuticle. Some plants have more than one layer of epidermis. That'll reduce transpirational losses. Incredible. And so maybe the, the king of them all uh, are these cam plants. And as a great example is cacti, and then you know, locally here we have ice plants. And these ice plants, you're like, how do they get away with living on the sand? Well, that's because they could store their water uh, in these fleshy leaves. And also, they have stomata on there, but they close. You ready for this? Cam plants close their stomata during the day. And you're like, how can they do that? You have to open the stomata in the day because photosynthesis only takes place during the day. Like, no, they open it at nighttime. Like, how do they, what are they going to do at night? Well, at night, they open their stom. What? At night, they open their stomata. Sorry about that. Let me see if I can bring that back. At night, they open their stomata so they can suck up the carbon dioxide at night, even though they're not photosynthesizing. But they bring it in, bring it in, bring it in. And then they attach it to already present organic acids, like malic acid and OAA, for example. And then they store it in their central vacuole. And it moves across the tunnelplast. And so they could store in, in their central vacuole basically like carbonated water. Carbonated water, like soda. Yeah, so it's real bubbly. No, I don't know, it's real bubbly, but let's just, just pretend that. Like soda, bubble, bubble, bubble. And then during the day when it's blazing hot, when it's most severe, they close down their stomata so they don't lose water. And then, look at this, they take the carbon, they remove one carbon from the, those organic molecules, and that's the carbon that they use in the Calvin cycle to produce glyceraldehyde phosphate. Pretty cool. Cam plants. So I hope you enjoyed that conversation on transpiration, guard cells opening and closing, and various uh, adaptations and modification to leaf anatomy, uh, morphology, and physiology in uh, xerophyte plants. Thanks for watching.